Hello, everyone out there. My name is Pittsburgh Pat, and I'm here with John Miklo. How are you today, John? Doing terrific, Pat. Good to see you, and good yeah. to see everyone out there virtually. It's always great to see you. We've uh, gotten to know each other a little bit, reading some books together and talking about them, and that's been really awesome. Um, everybody out there right now, though, if you could smash like the like button for us, that helps us tremendously because it sends this uh, video to the top of the algorithm and uh, allows people to benefit from the wisdom and knowledge that John's going to impart on us here today about sleep and dreams. But first, I just want to congratulate you. You just had a life achievement today, or I mean, not today, but this week, right? You just became certified as a firefighter. That's right. So I'm very excited about it. I've been on 19 calls in a week uh, wow. and broad range of uh, things. And one of the things that will uh, tie together with our topic today is I view this as a, a great method of giving back and volunteerism in our fire departments is down 75 percent. And many of the uh, responders that you deal with are volunteers. So they're giving their time freely. They're highly committed. And by giving back through uh, the fire fire department, um, I sleep better. So it all works out really well for me. I think it's amazing. I, you know, I'm, we talk a lot on this channel and in general, I usually say things like do something nice for somebody without getting caught. We talk about being able to like have those moments of um, generosity in our lives. And you have one built in now, like you, you are helping people, whether you kind of want to or not, you signed up for it. So it's like, it's ingrained in your schedule. That is a great way to like, you know, just do good on a, on an automatic basis. That's wonderful. There's I, one other Benny I get, they keep me in really good shape because it is a job that takes a little bit of fitness. So uh, I get all of that. Um, and the ability to uh, hopefully give back. So yeah, it's wonderful. I really enjoy it. I'm sure it's going to uh, affect your sleep strategy as well. There's going to be some interesting uh, moments when you're on call, that sort of thing. I've already had a few of those, and I think it's affecting my wife's sleeping pattern more than mine. Oh, <laughs> uh, she's worrying about you. No, the alarms just go off and the pagers go off. And, uh. Uh, like bounces you right out of your bed. So. Well, that's what it's designed to do, right? So we're going to my good REM sleep, you know, it's like, oh, no, <laughs> got to get back to that. So so I know you pretty well, but there are some people who are watching that may or may not. So uh, let's do a little uh, familiarization. I'm going to do like the, kind of this game show round where like you're just going to answer as many of these as you can quickly. And um, and I'll throw throw some stuff out there. You ready? Yes, sir. All right. What's the last song that you listened to or sang? So uh, I'm a big rock, uh, country music uh, guy. So um, uh, Man in Black by Johnny Cash. All right. Got to love that. What about um, what's the last book or what book are you currently reading? I know you usually read like three at a time, but what's the one that you just put down? Root most so I actually just extend myself into another book on stoicism. And Pat oh, and really? I shared a lot of uh, common uh, uh, opportunities to talk about stoics and stuff like that. It's, so it's really good. And uh a fun book and I'm about halfway through. And I also have been reading a lot on, um, it's called Code Breaker and it's about the uh, development of the vaccine and it's tie into CRISPR and sort of the genotypes of a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with um, on a daily basis, just to try to make sure that I understand, you know, all the science out there. And it's, it's all really very positive for us, really great, great technology innovations. So a little bit of light bedtime reading for you there. Gotcha. About, nope. Are you are you an Apple guy or are you an Android guy? I'm an Apple guy. Okay, that's cool. What about, um, what's the last thing you had to eat? So I'm a vegetarian. So uh, I just have tons of, of vegetarians. And just to tie again back to my firefighter buddies, there's not a lot of vegetarians that are firefighters. So I'm, I'm a, a very... Uh, behind the scenes kind of uh, non, non uh, committed uh, uh, vegetarian when I'm around my firefighter buddies. But uh, so I would have had just a wonderful uh, mixed berry salad. So when you uh, make that three alarm chili, you're going to have to throw tofu in there and or, or, uh, or what's that textured vegetable protein TVP instead of uh, meat. Little seitan, right? Yeah. Seitan. Yeah. There you go. What about, okay. If you saw two articles sitting by side by side, one was astrology and one was on astronomy. Which one would you read first? Astronomy. Okay. Is there a secret superpower or talent that you have that people look at you and they might not under, like realize that you have, like I'm a pretty good pool player. 
Uh, no, it, it, it's, it's actually my uh, sense of humor because it comes in very handy and it uh, catches people a bit by surprise. So it's a, it's a God-given gift to have a little bit of humor in your life. No doubt about that. That's a survival tactic for me as well. What about uh, the last one? If you could time travel into the past, where would you go? What time period? So, so I would probably um, go back into uh, the Genghis Khan era when uh, Mon, the Mon, uh, the Mon, that whole invasion and that whole dynasty uh, fascinates me. And it's not very well written about or understood, but it was a, an amazing domination of the globe. That's great. Uh, that's really a great tie-in because I have a future guest who's going to talk to us at length about Genghis Khan has actually traveled to Mongolia. And oh, got it. Really young man in his 20s and has already had that adventure. So, I mean, I look really look forward to having him on. All right, so great cool. tie-in. So, all right, but we're here to talk about sleep and maybe dreams today as well. So, John, how, how did you get interested in this? So, one, I'll make sure everybody knows I'm not a physician. Uh, but Yes, this I, is not medical advice. We're just having a conversation here, guys. Make sure everybody knows that. But um, I have been blessed to be around, I think, some of the greatest sleep experts in the world. And I did that through one of my jobs. I ran a company that invented CPAP for sleep disorder breathing and, and the creation of a mechanism to deal with obstructive sleep apnea. So like that Darth Vader mask that everybody wears. That gets... That's correct. Gotcha. And CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. And so we apply pressure, splint the airway open for people that have snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. So that was my early tie into it. But then I came to learn as, as I got more involved in the space, there's 80 different sleep disorders. And wow, there's 80? Yeah. I had and, no idea it was that many. Yep, and, and many of them don't have therapeutic interventions. And there's a ton of innovation going on in the space because we spend a third of our time in sleep. Mm -hmm. And Hopefully. It's, the thing, it's, gonna be, it's the thing that's gonna define your day. If you had a good sleep, you're gonna have a good day. If you had a bad sleep, it's, you're going to have a bad day. And it's just so fundamental to our health. And we know that there's a ton of comorbidities that occur if you don't get good sleep. So I'm very passionate about really attacking these other disorders like insomnia, phase shift disorders, circadian rhythms, restless leg, uh, beyond just sleep apnea, because right now we pretty much just treat sleep apnea. So I have a, a ritual that I do. I mean, now, now there's a term that's been coined recently that I've come across several times just in the last year or so. And it's called sleep hygiene. And um, I think you know what I'm talking about. But could you describe a little bit about sleep hygiene? So sleep hygiene is probably one of the more um, uh, straightforward methods to treat uh, both sleep onset and sleep maintenance. And, and what you got to understand about sleep is the longer you sleep, the, the more you go into your uh, restorative sleep, which is your REM and slow wave sleep, which are your deep sleeps. So that's where you dream. And, and that's where all the restorative stuff takes. And so if you never get there or you're only there for a limited time, it's really bad. And those phases actually get longer the longer you sleep. So if you sleep, through the night, you're going to get seven, eight hours of highly restorative REM slow wave sleep phases. And so sleep hygiene is intended to, to allow you to get sleep onset and maintain sleep. And sleep hygiene is, is sort of really the first line to treating insomnia. And what we mean by sleep hygiene is that your bed is a place to sleep. And one of the things that we know about insomnia is that looking and interacting with screens, phones, computers, uh, any of those kinds of things uh, create what's called phase shift and shift your circadian rhythms back into their awake cycles. And so sleep hygiene talks a lot about what you do a couple hours before you go to sleep. And then um, you never eat in your bed. Uh, you only sleep in your bed. If you can't sleep in your bed, you get up and get out of your bed and go do something else. And all of that's built around good methods and habits. The last part of sleep hygiene is more difficult because it asks you to try to go to sleep the same time or close to the same time. And, and what that does is just trying to adapt your circadian rhythms to a routine. But if you're able to do it, it really is a good mechanism to uh, treat things like insomnia. 
I've been fortunate. Uh, recently, I've been able to uh, uh, kind of wake before the sun rises and go to sleep just after sunset or maybe a few hours after sunset. And so it's amazing because I used to work nights and um, yep. many nights. And uh, boy, I used, I mean, I've always slept well. I've been blessed with that. But I can tell that, um, especially as I progress in age, um, how much more important it is. And I can really tell the difference uh, by having a set sleep schedule. But one of the habits that I have before I fall asleep is I kind of look at my day a little differently. Like uh, I look at my day as starting just before I go to sleep, like just before I go to bed. That's the beginning of my day. Because if I don't get that sleep, if I don't get that seven and a half hours or eight hours, that's what I usually get just naturally without having an alarm clock set. And I want to ask you about that too. But, um, you know, I have a, that's when, that's the start of my day because I figure like, and what I do is I try to like take care of everything that happened the day before, everything happened before 8 p.m. at 8 p.m. And then that's it. Try not to make too many phone calls or emails or anything like that uh, if I can. Um, and then, you know, and then I, and then because what I found is if I'm, if I'm re examining my day at night, then I'm reliving that day as I dream. And I don't want to do that. What I try to do is I try to set positive intentions on what I might get done the following day. And then I kind of allow myself to play with those ideas as I sleep and see if I can, you know, come up with some creative ideas to implement those things. And it seems to be effective for me. I don't know if that's a technique that you've heard of, or if that's anything that's, um, you know, it goes along anything that you talk about with um, preparing yourself for restful sleep. Yeah, that's that's right down the middle of good sleep sleep behavior. So, um, you know, the notion that we all live in a very stressful world and the degree to which that uh, permeates our ability to stop thinking about it and induce sleep is is a killer. And so, um, your ability to uh, really reset your thinking and one of the best methods for uh, allowing you to do that is this concept of lucid dreaming, where prior to going to sleep, you think about the things that you want to dream about. And in the context of dreaming about them, your subconscious is fully engaged if you get into your deep wave uh, REM and slow wave sleep. And you actually get lucid dreams that are going right after the things that you asked your subconscious to think about. And they are absolutely revealing in terms of answers and, and direction. And it is the most amazing thing and it takes a little practice but everybody can do lucid dreaming and you know you got it nailed if you start dreaming in color because yes. now you both lucid dreams that are vivid and that's your that's your ideal answer to to everything that you just talked about so your strategy is very good thanks i i have had some experience with lucid dreaming um i know i read about it once because i heard about it as a technique for kids who had nightmares or night terrors they would call them recurring right. nightmares and uh, I mean, I've had my, I've had a couple of those. I, I haven't been plagued by them, but I, that's not why I did it. I just, I just thought it was fascinating. But the way I kind of entered into it was by taking uh, short naps in the afternoon while I was trying to learn the technique. And uh, I, I found a, a, a belly full of pasta that helped me to like uh, get ready for that. And, uh, but what I would do is in the experiment, I don't do this at night, but in an experiment, I would leave TV or radio on that's how old I am. There was a radio. And, uh, and, and I would uh, try to sleep. Fall. I would take a nap with my hands on my chest because what would happen is I would like become like, dimly aware that I was sleeping, but I was unable to move because the body doesn't want us to hit ourselves in our sleep. Right. And so in order to wake myself up, I would, I would try to roll and then usually an arm falling you know, towards the floor would be enough to of a signal for my body to wake up. But what was interesting, and that and that could be a little bit intense. <laughs> Being aware that you're awake but not able to move can be a little bit of that's the part of lucid dreaming that can be a little bit scary, I think. But um, but once you know that that's just natural and perfectly normal and 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 actually expected, because if you don't do that, that's not actually a bad thing. Um, you're talking about restless sleep. But what I found was what was interesting is the passage of time was distorted. So I could have a dream where hours would elapse and yet I'm still listening to the same song on the radio. Yeah. So what's that? Right. All about? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, 
So for everyone, you know, if you want to learn more about lucid dreaming, I would recommend this this book. It's really good. It's exploring the world of lucid dreaming. And you move that a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Exploring the world of lucid lucid dream by Laberge and Rheingold. Right. We'll put Excellent. a link to that in the in the comment section or in the uh, description of the video. Excellent way to learn about it. And and one of the things that. Um, you touched on was this notion of napping and napping is a very powerful mechanism for maintenance of your, um, your ability to stay very focused during the day. So being able to take a, and you don't want to take a nap longer than 20 minutes because that puts you into uh, sleep patterns where you start releasing these chemicals that do paralyze you. <laughs> gotcha. And so you want your naps to be very short and restorative and not wake up groggy, but wake up refreshed. And if you can do a 20 minute nap sometime during the day, you will find that to be a powerful tool. So I've heard of airline pilots doing this um, in shifts, sometimes on long haul flights where the co-pilot will say, OK, you take a five minute nap. I'll take you know, and they do that in other situations where it's a you know, sniper teams, other things like that, where they're in. Uh, situations that require their attention but they have to have active inattention yep. in order to regain that attention which i always thought was a very fascinating concept and, and yeah. sleep is definitely a tool for that called vigilance you know the degree to which you can do that your vigilance uh, goes up significantly so right yeah. and the uh the other thing i was going to say about the uh, to get back to what we were talking about before about how long i sleep uh, oh, I know what I was going to say. They, so um, I heard that Pablo Picasso, when he would, he, you know, when he would take a, a siesta, as is the custom in Spain, especially in the southern parts where it gets really hot. So in the hottest part of the afternoon, people would like retire for uh, an hour or so and, and, and sometimes take a short nap. Like you said, not an hour long nap. His idea was that he would hold a piece of fruit in his hand, either an apple or an orange, and he would just kind of doze and and as he dozed, when he got relaxed enough that the apple fell out of his hand, that would wake him up. And that was his siesta, which can be a little thing if you don't have a timer, if you don't have your phone, everybody has their phone now, it seems like. But if you don't, that's a good way to like time yourself, I guess, to see if you've gotten, I mean, are you going to get enough? Are you going to fall asleep at that point? Probably, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, you can definitely fall asleep. And and uh, actually, uh, this has already been a winning uh, uh, uh period of time for me because i didn't know the picasso story so i love that one. Oh, there you uh, go great i'll have to look into that that's pretty cool yeah look yeah definitely uh double fact check me there because sometimes i get my metaphors mixed but i'm pretty sure it was picasso the um so, what i wanted to touch on to make sure i don't forget it and and it's sort of some of the newer kinds of methods for people with uh sleep issues to get help is there is a really good new set of technology for doing what's called home-based sleep testing. Mm -hmm. And the home test is so much better because people really struggle going to the hospital or a sleep lab and, sure. you know, having to sleep in front of other people in an unfamiliar space. And we actually now have enough data that says that you're going to get much better studies by studying the patient in their real sleep environment. And you can get a home sleep study prescribed from your primary care physician, and you'll take it over two or three days, and it'll give us very good indications of your sleep patterns, your oxygenation, your depth of sleep, all of those kinds of things. And it's a really great key uh, and easy to do. You get it mailed to you, you wire it up by yourself, it comes with a video, and off you go. Nice. And in three days, we'll have a great profile of your sleep. So if you're really struggling with trying to understand or find somebody to help and don't want to do an in-hospital sleep test, um, I recommend that um, through your primary care physician. Sure. That's fantastic. I mean, I just get tense just going into the doctor's office. And like, here, yeah. let's get your blood pressure. Well, geez, I just, <laughs> I fought traffic to get here. I couldn't find the elevator and, not, and I'm going to the doctor. What do you think is going to be my blood pressure? But no, I'm just kidding. But Usually my blood pressure is fine. In fact, I just recently got my annual physical. And what I thought was interesting was that my doctor asked me how I slept. And I said, like a baby. And then he looked or she looked at uh, the chart and said, yeah, um, I can see that. How, yeah. how did you know that from my blood work? Like that's I don't get it. What's the what's the deal? How can they tell? 
So, so there are all kinds of chemicals get, that get released uh, into your system, uh, your endorphins and all of those things that give you the restorative sleep that show up in your blood work. Um, and those that don't get good sleep, you know, just have terrible uh, blood profiles. And a lot of it leads to these comorbidities and the comorbidities are so clear. There are things like diabetes, weight gain, uh, daytime sleepiness, uh, high incident of accidents, uh, cardiovascular disease. So not getting good sleep has, has a lot of significant consequences for people. And the real wicked part about it is, particularly for sleep apnea, if you have sleep apnea, it typically will be somebody that has, you know, a neck size greater than 17. And it, in, in having apneic events, the, you can get those 60 to 70 times every hour. So every hour you're wow. arousing, waking up. Once a minute because, you're waking up. Because you stop breathing and, and you so can die. The, um, the size 17 neck, that's just a physiological thing about the airway maybe? or Yes, that's right. Okay. It's highly correlated to the likelihood. It's not saying for certain, but it's highly, it's a good place to start. I see. And, gotcha. And, and uh, so these patients um, are suffering and the chemicals that get released induce hunger desire. Mm. And so you, and so you wake up, you can't hungry. sleep, eat because you've been, and it just is this pattern that's like, that, and so if you don't get it treated, it's really uh, very difficult. Isn't um, it true so. with so many things? There's a cycle, you know? One thing leads to the other. And so it's as like, like you said, you know, having that, like going to bed with an intention and then waking up the next day and just these small things that, that you can do that can lead to larger, um, larger benefits, you know? Right. And, exactly. and unfortunately, vice versa, you know? Yep. Like right. having that cup of coffee and chocolate before you go to bed, you know, or too soon to bed. And just, it's just, you know, your body's like, wait a minute, I got, a, I got two stimulants running around in me and you're trying to sleep. What's going on here? Uh, in well, fact, I, the worst crime is, I, and I can't stand to watch it, but it's in our children that are watch, looking at phones late at night and mm. it's shifting rhythms and they sit around and say, I can't sleep. So then we put them on medication and it, it's the wrong, all of that is all the bad answer. It's like, don't look at your phone for two hours and go to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Tough. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny uh, when I know that I have to sleep, sometimes I get a little bit anxious about not being able to sleep or wake up. And uh, so over the years, I've developed some techniques to do that non non chemical techniques. Well, maybe not. I'm not sure if this is chemical or not, but it's uh, I think it's rather benign. Um, I have conditioned myself to the point where if I drink a cup of chamomile tea, um, I'm pretty much out like within 20 minutes. But I think I know that chamomile has a calming effect, but I suspect that it's a conditioning. It's, it's me conditioning myself and it's a psychosomatic effect that I've built upon over the years because I only do that when I'm in a situation where I want to fall asleep. I don't just like say, oh, it's noon. Let's have some chamomile tea. You know, I've like reserved that as a cue for my body to say, okay, this is an indicator, you know, chemical indicator. You're going to go to sleep now. So um, that's one thing that I've done. Uh, and I also have certain music that I can't listen to. Like I can't put Enya on in the car. Like I would be afraid I would have an accident because it's just, it's something it gives, it starts those waves, whatever. I know there's alpha, beta, theta. I don't know what they all mean, but I'm sure you do, but I'm sure that whatever that her voice has become a, a, a sleep uh, wave generator in my brain now because of that conditioning. So what you're doing with chamomile is you're actually just relaxing. And, and it goes back to your old thing is you're trying to put the day behind you and you're taking a deep breath and you're getting yourself ready for the next thing. So, I mean, it's very supportive that way. And if you're ever going to really uh, want to try a, an inert kind of easy method, um, use melatonin um, as your, your first line of, of uh, attempts. If you're really having difficulty, it doesn't really help with sleep maintenance, but it helps with sleep onset. I noticed that exercise helps me to sleep too, but how soon before bed should I not exercise? An hour. One hour? That's it? Yeah. Wow. How about that? Yeah, it stores itself and comes back to, to baseline pretty fast post-exercise. And I've also and, heard but, that there's nothing better for muscle development than a good nap after a workout as well. Absolutely. It goes, once again, kicks in all these restorative elements. And, you know, 
the main restorative element is your neuro capacity, but it does uh, all of your cardiovascular and muscular uh, capacities. Um, all those chemicals uh, occur to um, allow you to, you know, restore yourself after, and we're built that way, you know, so sleep is ubiquitous, right? Every animal sleeps. And so they do it for a reason, right? <laughs> to, to get restored. And if you don't do it, then you're going against nature. Gotcha. So that go get them lifestyle, four hours of sleep, coffee, 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 stimulants. Get- uh, that's, that's, that's totally against nature. Like it's just totally against it. And, and while you may feel like it's your best you, um, it really isn't. Um, and a lot of people do very well with that kind of lifestyle, but there's even something uh, that you have that's way better, more powerful if you got good restorative sleep. I wonder if there've been any studies done to see how longevity is affected by people who only sleep like uh, four hours a night. Uh, oh, absolutely. There, there's uh, some really good studies that talk about sleep and longevity and um, it, it, it ties into a lot of the work in nutrition um, mm. and, you know, both nutritional uh, stuff and sleep stuff are very closely aligned in terms of life, life expectancy. Okay. Gotcha. So one thing that I wanted to touch on that we talked about really early was the duration of sleep. When I was talking about everybody thinks eight hours, one third of our day, but like I said, I usually get about seven and a half or sometimes nine there seems to be, at least I've read that an hour and a half cycle. Is that true? Or is that just like old data that I'm like uh, coughing up from some scientific American from the 1980s? That's probably some old data because um, I think the data now has been very well um, documented that minimum of seven is, is good. And that your body, if it naturally, if it's a natural uh, extension of sleep to nine, that's fine. Um, and you're not, you're actually helping yourself by maximizing your sleep duration and, um, six is, is just not enough. What, what about catching up on sleep on the weekends? How's that like doesn't work? Doesn't work. No, there's, there, there's nothing, there's no such thing as a sleep bank where, where you get to be able to bank your hours whenever you can. Gotcha. That's not the way body works. It needs That's- its duration of sleep and it has to go into these sleep states of slow wave sleep regularly every day. Your circadian, they call it circadian rhythms for a reason. It's a rhythm and it's a mechanism. And every animal does it, right? They, they sleep regularly. They go to bed when the go- sun goes down or they wake up when the sun goes down. Um, and, you know, they do this for a reason because they're in light patterns. They're following the light, mm. which circadian rhythms to induce sleep. And um, no, sorry, no sleep bank. That doesn't work. It's funny you mentioned light patterns. I have a friend who's really big into the dark sky. Um, That's her crusade, basically. She wants to uh, minimize uh, uh, unnecessary lighting, uh, Mm -hmm. but she's an astronomer, so she can see the stars. But one of the things she talked about, she actually did a TED Talk. She talked about its impact on animals and humans, um, you know, constantly being around light sources. And screens, obviously, are the are the big culprit but just having like you know living in an urban environment with um you know street lighting every everywhere so when you you know even your windows are closed maybe the curtains are partially drawn or you know they're they're translucent you still get light from from the outside and you, you know your body never gets a chance to like say ah it's dark it's time to sleep you know because that's what humans we, that's when we sleep Right. Yeah, this this goes back to our conversation on sleep hygiene that, that I didn't mention. There's two other things that you can really do to help your sleep uh, with sleep hygiene. One is a dark space, um, you know, creating a dark space. The, the second is that your body actually uh, lowers its body core body temperature about two to three degrees before you go into sleep. So the extent that you can have just a slightly cooler space to sleep in will allow your body to get to that core temperature that will induce sleep. So that's a really nice methodology in, in your sleep hygiene mechanisms, dark rooms and, and colder temperatures. So dark rooms, cool temperatures, no screens two hours before. You can exercise up to an hour before. You can do anything that causes you to relax, chamomile tea. Um, we didn't even talk about meditation. Is meditation a substitute for sleep? Uh, yeah, well, it's not a substitute for sleep, but it's a great sleep mechanism to induce sleep. Um, and it's actually probably one of the better. 
And a lot of people, when they meditate, feel like they might be sleeping, but they're really never changing their sleeping patterns um, in terms of the, the, the different waves of sleep that you, you go down the ladder of sleep um, to, to REM and, and slow wave. So uh, it doesn't do that, but it does work wonders for sleep onset. Here's another thing that I may be old data, but if I wake up and I remember my dreams, am I interrupting a cycle? Am I supposed to remember my dreams or am I supposed to come out without remembering my dreams? No, you want to remember your dreams because your dreams are trying to tell you something. And so I, I, keep, I keep a sleep diary um, next to my bed. And the problem is your ability to retain the, the essence of a dream are very limited. So you almost have to do it right when you can remember it. And, and then just write down just a few key things about that dream, and then it'll re-trigger the full dream. Um, and so I, if you really want to get into uh, analyzing dreams, two things. You, you should get a, a dream diary or a dictionary. Um, and I actually have a recommendation on that. This is a dream dictionary. And whose name? Crisp. The author's name at the bottom is, I can barely see it, Crisp. Oh, Tony Crisp. Tony Crisp. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we'll put a link to that too. And, and uh, so the reason is this actually tells you what all the uh, the dream prototypes are, or what, what, what it is, what's it mean when you see an eagle, or what does it mean when you see this? Oh, the and symbolism. Helps, okay. Yeah, symbolism. So it lets you um, really dissect and determine your dreams by understanding what those symbols are. Hmm. It's really very accurate. So when I'm having a flying dream, what's, what am I doing? What's that? So that, that typically means you're off to a very good day. Um, oh. so hopefully you don't crash. <laughs> so what about the opposite? What about a falling dream? So falling dreams are probably one of the most common. And a lot of that is uh, tied to your fear of awakening. Um, and so you're constantly worried that, you know, that you're going to awake and, and that's what wakes you up is you think they're falling. And so you come out of your sleep and wow. it doesn't tend to mean too much from a, from a symbolic uh, component, but it happens a lot. Yeah. I've heard that's a basic uh, human fear. It's hardwired. In this. They, say, they say there's some fears that are acquired, but fear of falling is, is just like a self-defense mechanism. It's wired into the human nervous system. And. So yeah. And, and when you're asleep, you, you feel like a, you have a high, a high defense mechanism against falling. I would imagine you would think uh, you would have a high defense mechanism because you'd have to be somewhat alert in order to like, you know, from our natural instincts, we'd have to be alert for predators and threats yeah. when we sleep. So you would think that there would be a, some kind of like radar that would go off. You know, so. So the cats have it down, right? The cats have their little ear radar ear up and they sleep so sound before they can wake up in a second, right? Yeah, they sure can. Have you ever startled a cat un oh, unintentionally yeah. or intentionally yeah. as a child? You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. uh, it's not a great strategy for not getting yeah. clawed. <laughs> Cheetahs or lions either. <laughs> well, who was the guy who said I've I've lived with three Zen masters, all of them cats. Yeah, well, I agree with that. So there's was Eckhart Tolle. Yeah, but uh, they tend to sleep a lot. Um, yeah, well, I can't think of too much more. I mean, we could go on and on, but um, this, you know. I, I really did. I hope uh, people were able to take away something from the range of conversation. We could touch on a lot of subjects. And uh, I wish everyone a great day and a wonderful, restful night of sleep. Thanks. I'm sure we'll all sleep better knowing the things that we know now. If you do have any specific questions, put them in the comments below. Maybe we'll have John back and he can answer some of them for us. Um, great. Have, have a great day. Thanks again, John. And uh, see, see if you can do something nice for somebody today without getting caught.